the Trump team's peace plan for Ukraine seems to overlap with the Kremlin-approved China peace plan. Suffice it to say, this plan is not a winning scenario for Ukraine and would significantly weaken the economic, political and military agency of Ukraine in future. It would also be a gift to the dictator of Russia, Vladimir Putin. It would give him the perception of a victory and reinforce the idea that the West lacks the will and conviction in its own professed values, namely the sanctity of sovereignty, rule of law, freedom, innovation, and the rights of small countries not to fall within the spheres of influence or control of their bullying neighbors. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please, if you like this material, if you like the speakers we got on the channel, make sure you subscribe, like it, share it, and make sure other people get to see it too. Also, please check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. And if you're not politically active and you do support Ukraine, this is a very good time to get active. Pick a side, pick a side that is supportive of Ukrainian victory. Well, today I'm delighted to talk to Taran Sims for the second time. He is a combat veteran, businessman, political leader, and graduate of the Military Academy at West Point. He chairs the DNC's Veterans and Military Families VMF Council and previously served as Chief of Staff to Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Taran has decades of operational and leadership experience in the Department of Defense and throughout the federal government. Mr. Sims served in political roles of increasing responsibility over the past decade. In 2008 and 2012, he was director Virginia VMF for Obama and served on the defense and veterans policy team, where he wrote the service member life insurance policy. In 2010, Mr. Sims wrote the Democratic National Committee's VMF candidates platform, which is used in federal campaigns nationwide. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Good to be well, back. our first conversation was 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 thrilling, and there was a lot of really fascinating detail to pick through. Uh, I think this one might be. Uh, we, we hopefully will 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 top that, um, and I think it promises to be uh, a challenging sort of conversation. Now, Kamala Harris uh, is, of course, competing against Donald Trump for the position of President of the United States, and of course, you know, head of. The armed forces, all these kind of things, um, as well as the leadership role in foreign policy. She has shown, I think, in her rhetoric so far, uh, a lot of leadership skills and a desire to win domestically. But can this be translated in desire for Ukraine to win, for a Ukrainian victory also? I mean, simple answer is yes. I mean, if, if you're a single issue voter and you believe in... Um, the right for Ukraine to exist as the people of Ukraine define themselves and define their borders as of whatever date those borders were set, then the only candidate you can vote for is Kamala Harris because um, Donald Trump has clearly stated numerous times that he supports uh, Vladimir Putin's plan, strategy, um, means of existence and in, in regards to Ukraine's uh, sovereignty and independence. That, that's a clear cut choice in the coming election. Well, we'll come to Trump and what he apparently stands for in his peace plan in a minute, because I think it's important to uh, debunk a lot of the gaslighting that's gone on there. Kamala Harris has also said some really intriguing things. She's used the word freedom a lot, which I think is, is, is absolutely fascinating, the context she uses that word. <laughs> She's also used the phrase, the politics of possibility. This sounds to me like a call to empower people, to give them agency to do what they want with their lives, whether that is, is business or uh, you know, so, you know, supporting society or education, whatever it happens to be. But these are absolutely intriguing phrases. But again, let's translate this into what Russia represents. Russia is, I would say, the antithesis of that power of freedom and possibility. So you cannot be for a Russian victory or enabling a Russian victory if you believe in freedom politics, which is what she says her campaign is about. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The Republican Party, at least the modern day Republican Party that, that's existed um, since just after Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson's presidency. So Richard Nixon on 
has always touted themselves as small government, small government, which we as Americans had equated to freedom because the government, if federal government in this case is small, then you as the private citizen have more freedom to do the things that you want or need to do to better your lives. But as the Republican Party has shown um, throughout you know, the past few decades, um, they're not about small government. They're not about freedom, because if you want to uh, kick out all supposed illegal immigrants, if you want to control um, how w women's reproductive rights, right? Uh, if you want to control um, the books that children are reading, well, you need a very massive government to do that, right? And these are the things Republicans are touting. And so Kamala Harris, by using the word freedom, right? Freedom to read the books you want to read, freedom to make decisions, um, your, your own healthcare decisions, right? Freedom to come to this country, just like the mass majority of people did other than, you know, my ancestors and, you know, I guess both my native and my African ancestors, right? Um, and so pushing on that, because then to the point with Russia, Russia is the uh, is the opposite of freedom, right? In, in the case of how it's how its country is run, right? And so if if you were for freedom, then you can't be for um, Russia winning in in, in 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 Ukraine, and therefore, again, there's only one person you could vote for if you truly believe in freedom as we're defining it now in the United States, and that's Kamala Harris. And there's an interesting announcement that I think was just coming out uh, just before we actually came on on air here. And it's the announcement that President Joe Biden uh, and Kamala Harris will hold separate meetings with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on the 26th of September. Mm -hmm. How significant is it, not only in the sort of handover process from incumbent president to potentially the next president, but also this idea that Kamala Harris is going to be given the space to develop her own approach, her own foreign policy, and potentially um, a completely new team, new mindset and a way of thinking uh, towards how Ukraine is supported. So your latter part on, on the question is definitely, at the end of the day, really the most important. Because if you're going to start preparing to be president, then you need to begin having these, these conversations um, without your principal present because you have to shape what the strategy is going to look like and how to support such strategies. But I think the spirit of the question, um, as far as the American people are concerned, is what's really most important because you have to be a good candidate before you can be a good um, good executive, right? You got to win the race before you can actually serve. And it, it's great. One, I, one I, I truly respect President Biden quote unquote, giving her the space to do that um, because he doesn't have to yet because she's still in days the vice president. And because it, it's important, especially in our country where it is, you know, this is what it is. We're going to be honest here. We are still a racist, misogynist country, right? We, uh, we don't fully trust um, the, the uh, intellectual and strategic abilities of, of black people and she, uh, and women. And she is combined in both. And, this reminds me of a conversation I had with, um, I won't say the name of the person, but during the, um, nothing negative, but um, during Secretary Clinton's campaign in 2016. And I had spoken on a, on a panel with her and a few other people whose names you would, you, you would recognize. And it was on national security, defense, veteran issues, really great conversation, right? We talk, spoke the whole gamut, right? And um, panel was great. And I was like, we need to duplicate this thing. And my reasoning to that, to her, to, to some of her senior advisors on the campaign, one in particular, um, whose name you would recognize, um, is that because she's a woman, we have got to project to the voters that she is strong on these issues. I know she's strong. You know she's strong. Our collective knows she's strong. Right. But the world doesn't because she's a woman. It's not her fault. But that's just is it in our society. And so going to uh, the issue of, of Vice President Harris meeting with with President Zelensky, it shows the American people that she that she is capable and that she's able today to to lead in these efforts, not just um, in Ukraine, which is probably our most um, important strategic level um, international issue 
depending on how you want to define that, 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 that we're currently dealing with. Um, yeah. So bad way to end the, end the answer, but, <laughs> but yeah. Who they appoint to their team is critical, isn't it? Because right. we'll come to the current team. We'll touch upon the current team and the current policy. Um, certainly, because I think those who are pro Ukraine want to see fresh thinking and uh, renewed vigor in the support of Ukraine. But, it's interesting to see the other side, to see who Trump has surrounded himself with, because there are a lot of, uh, especially Reaganite Republicans, are saying, well, you know, we don't know what Trump's going to do. He probably hasn't decided himself, et cetera, et cetera. But he's surrounded himself with uh, Robert Kennedy uh, and J.D. Vance. And these guys have not said complimentary things about Ukraine. In fact, they have repeated Russian narratives, propaganda narratives over and over and over again, um, almost on a loop. And I struggle to see if Trump is getting his cue from these guys and others within that ecosystem. It is impossible to see how um, his victory can be anything but a disaster for Ukraine. Well, there's a couple of things in there. Mm -hmm. The choice of team. But also the idea that, that, that Russian narratives are being repeated so vocally within the political ecosystem of the U.S. is something that was inconceivable uh, 20 years ago, for instance. I mean, yeah, um, you know, we, you know, Vice President Harris, um, you know, in, we'll just in President Biden as well, because um, right now it's kind of combined with dealing with this issue at the moment. But, you know, their team, whether you like them or not, whether you think highly of them or not, they at least are individuals who do research and they study and they speak with subject matter experts, both you know, civilian and military, right? They, 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 they are working and collaborating with both NATO and Ukrainian neighboring countries and whatever other countries and NGOs and organizations that are looking to looking to, or are supporting Ukraine's ind independent or fight for independence. Right. So at least with vice president Harris and the team that she has, they at least are open. They're they're um, collaborative. Um, they're they they have this the capability to learn, to adjust, um, to compromise, and to do the things that are needed in order to um, help Ukraine maintain its sovereignty. Whereas with President Trump, you know his his issue one as we all know he just surrounds himself with sycophants. So, you know, and so we know the, the type of people they are and the type of people he is just based upon that that connotation in itself. But then when, you, when you're taking this and you're applying it to the issue of the Ukrainian-Russian war, um, right, it, they're getting all their 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 propaganda from 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 Russian media and Russian trolls and Russian bots and whatever. Right. Um, and it's not it, it isn't. It isn't because they necessarily believe in this stuff. That's probably the worst part, right? They know it's false, but they're pushing out to American people and having them digest this in the in the belief that this is true in order to to switch or get get them to vote for them in order to win, maintain a victory. You know, for all we know, you know, tr Donald Trump. Actually, we do know he's primary using this weapon as a means to to win the election, not because he cares about. Russia in and of itself, though, you know, as you know, as you stated earlier, it's it's more of his love affair for Vladimir Putin more so than loving Russia, right? Um, and then so you know, you, you look at folks like JD Vance or or Kennedy, since you you mentioned their names, mm -hmm. they're, they're opportunists. Um, that's it, right? You, you could probably find something that both of them have said negative about, especially Kennedy, for how, how old he is. J.D. Vance is a child, um, so he didn't grow up like like you and I did during the era of the Soviet Union. But we know Kennedy did. Right. And so to flip from wanting to fight with Patrick Swayze and Red Dawn to wanting to fight with Stalin youth um, against the Ukrainians just leads me to know that the people Trump wants to surround himself with has nothing to do with any real ideology or any real intellectual thought or process into why they're doing X, Y, and Z. It's simply to attain and, or in this case for President Trump, retain power. 
Uh, absolutely, it's 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 uh, it, it's immoral as well. Uh, mm-hmm. we definitely point that out as well. Um, and but some of the details of the so-called peace plan, because for the last couple of years, Trump has said this full-scale war wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, on my watch, well, he doesn't say full scale and it ignores the fact the war was already going on uh, during his presidency and he didn't, right. didn't need to stop it. Um, but he says it wouldn't have happened and I can stop it within 24 hours. Well, that was all we knew until recently. But details have emerged from Viktor Orban and from Vance himself that the plan actually is to pressure Ukraine to give or cede the territory it's lost to Russia in perpetuity, but also give a bunch of other territory that Russia does not possess and preclude itself from joining NATO, joining the EU, international institutions, probably putting Mm -hmm. a cap or a limit on the size of its army. This is is basically not a a peace plan, a surrender plan. The challenge is that Kamala Harris is making incredibly strong noises around Ukraine, But as you say, she's in this research phase and it's politically sensitive. So she may not be able at this point to give the detail behind her policies and put flesh on those bones. Do you think that's something we'll start to see prior to November or is it is it quite a tricky period to start putting fully fledged kind of policy um, strategies out there with all that detail? Yeah, it, it wouldn't be prudent for her to go into detail as to what level of uh, change in our current um, support um, she would she would provide or, you know, however you would would want to word that, uh, because to the point she she is not yet she has not yet been elected president. Uh, God willing, we win we go once we get into the transition period, then that would be the opportunity for her to um, the prudent opportunity for her to. Um, push out uh, that messaging. Uh, the fortunate thing is that um, because she is supportive or fully supportive of what she and President Biden administration is doing in, in support of Ukraine, um, those actions, activities um, are occurring and are being pushed out there. And so there probably isn't going to be a whole lot of, um, I, I wouldn't see too much change or pivot from um, what we're already doing um, I'd be curious to know, just like you probably are, what changes there would be. Um, obviously, the the landscape has changed over the past six months with Ukraine um, moving into Russian territory, which I was wanting them to do three years ago <laughs> or two years ago. Sorry, I'm getting old, um, but I'm glad they're doing that. So, you know, not to throw anything out there, but, you know, the deeper they get into Russia, you know, the the, the longer the the log train gets, right? And so that would probably be something that's going to have to be addressed. Um, you know, um, munitions. Of course, the you know our House of Representatives is under you know they're they're in election period as well, right? So the shape of what our you know for all the U.S. listeners out there, don't just vote for president, vote for a Democratic congressman also and senator because. Um, but the, the House of Representatives is also up for election. So if we are able to regain um, the majority in the House, then that better assists um, or strengthens uh, Vice President Harris's, in this case, President-elect Harris's ability to support Ukraine's efforts. If it's a re- if it remains a Republican, excuse me, uh, majority, it's we're not sure yet because we're going to have to deal with the the downfall of Donald Trump and and how that's going to affect party politic. And this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because if you talk to those in the pro-Ukraine bubble, um, likely there's a lot of people watching this and they say, well, hang on a second. If it's a continuation of the current policy, the current policy has never articulated victory, how victory should be achieved or even what victory means. Ukrainians are, are pretty clear on what that is. And you could ask any Ukrainian on the street um, yep. and its return of their sovereign territory, taking territory in, in Russia, Kursk. They don't want that land. It's simply a bargaining chip to get back what is legally theirs. Um, yep. Reparations, justice for the genocide and war crimes. These are fairly clear and simple statements. But, and this isn't just Biden, we have not heard an articulation of what victory is and how victory can be achieved 
by any of the Western leaders, including NATO. So this is a little bit of a challenge here. I mean, the Baltics are a little different, maybe Poland, Romania. You'll get a clearer articulation of this, which is close <laughs> to what the Ukrainians right. will say. But this is the big challenge. If it's a continuation of the current policies, that would probably lead to Ukraine bleeding out and potentially ceding a victory to Russia. So there's 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 a there's a real challenge here. I mean, it's a challenge, of course, right? Um, simple way of, of phrasing that. But I think it's it's in our best interest not to state what victory is because we're in a supportive role. So for us, if I were, you know, POTUS for, you know, in regards to answering this question, for me, it's more of how do I support you, my friend Ukraine, in attaining whatever you're defining as the victory, more so than me coming to you and telling you here's what the victory is. And it maybe, you know, let's just say, you know, simply that the victory is retaining or maintaining their quote unquote traditional border. Right. But maybe there's something else in there that we just don't know about that. Um, that if if it were to go public um, would make matters worse than they are. Um, I, I think that. Um, even if that weren't the case, I think it, it is in our best interest not to run around shouting, here's what how we're defining victory, but more of it's like your friend coming and you say, I need help. OK, well, you know, if you need, you know, a loaf of bread, I'll give you the loaf of bread. I don't need to know that um, whatever you're going to do with the bread or whatever, not not to use a bad analogy, but it's not our war at the end of the day. Right. If the Ukrainians decide to just give up which I, they won't, but if they were to decide just to give up and say, F it, then who are we to tell them, no, you're wrong, even though we would tell them that, but I'm not going to keep supporting your war if you're not willing to support yours. So, yeah, I don't I don't see the need for us. Now, to your point with Poland and them, that's a different story. <laughs> but yeah, so that that's how I feel about that one. It's interesting, isn't it? Because if you take the Korsk incursion, which you just mentioned, and you're broadly supportive of that, in fact, militarily, I think we talked in the last time that something like this makes absolute sense militarily, even if political considerations are different and based on different criteria. In my view, that campaign still is showing success. It's putting huge pressure on the Russian regime. It has now done one of the things I predicted for it, which is that it would force president putin to uh to go for another round of mobilization which which mm-hmm. puts a huge strain on his economy um and on the uh, say the fragility perhaps of his regime um but this move was not announced to allies they did not pick up the phone to jake sullivan and say hey jake how do you feel about us taking a chunk of russian territory because the answer would have been you know after you know, certain people had finished wiping the sweat from their brows or other things <laughs> from other places. Um, they would have said no, no, absolutely no. In the same way, it is believed the strikes on uh, energy infrastructure, dual use energy infrastructure, was also something that the uh, administration was acutely uncomfortable with. Um, yeah, but Ukraine's done it. They've done yeah. it. They, they've uh, they. <laughs> They um, see, seek forgiveness, not permission, I think they've decided. And they've changed the rules of the game. Um, if you can answer that both politically and militarily, because I think these are two different answers here. Yeah, I mean, I technically kind of glossed on that. I mean, it's their war, right? Like if I had been advising them from day one, recognizing that Russia's army is a paper tiger. It's a big paper tiger. But it's a paper tiger in the day. Right. They don't have the resources, as they proved the first three months of the war, to really do anywhere close to what the United States could do if it decided to go take over a small country militarily. Right. So recognizing that fact and recognizing that resources are slim, both over in the Ukraine and Eastern Europe and in Russia. You, you know, Ukrainian military and President Zelensky had to, their, their leadership had to de- de- decide. How do we take the fight to them and how do we get this fight out of our country so that uh, more importantly, so that Russia starts depleting their own resources and doing said actions, causing them to pull resources out of Ukraine back into Russia. And the only way to do that is to take the fight to them. So, you know, if I'd have been Jake and gotten that call, 
I'd have been supportive and then just been ready to get cussed out by President Biden. But, you know, that, that just is what it is sometimes um, because no risk for no reward. And, you know, for those of us who served on the battlefield, sometimes you got to make hard decisions and not hard decisions in the case of like killing people, but just hard decisions that you, where you don't know what the next outcome is going to be. Right. Real clear. Right. So I can I understand um, any, you know, our administration or, or, you know, Great Britain, you know, not wanting Ukraine to do X, Y, and Z because it might stir things up or make things harder. But at the end of the day, it's their war and they've got to be able to win it um, through their they have to win it through their efforts. And if, if it's got if it's going to be a real victory where the Russian people are going to recognize, oh, Ukraine's not playing. Then it's got to be them start being on the on the offensive because you can't win a war defensively or managerially for that matter. And I think you right. touch on an incredibly important point there, which is the so-called escalation management, um, which is the accusation made or the label put on the current policy that prizes stability, certainty, status quo. Um, it puts these things, things you think you can control it places those perhaps to be more important than freedom and the uncertainty that's perhaps required to, to get you to that difficult point of, of freedom, which Ukrainians are seeking. These are kind of managerial virtues. You know, you supply the weapons, you want to know exactly what happens to every single one and where they're going to be used. And you want to be able to predict the outcome more or less so you can fine tune and control everything. Those are managerial virtues. Those are not leadership qualities. Um, all you can do with those kind of policies is contain the crisis rather than right. solve the crisis. So is Kamala Harris a leader or a manager? Does she contain issues or does she get to grips with actually solving them? I'd say she gets to grip to solving them. Um, you know, if you look at her tenure as uh, attorney general, California, which, you know, my math may be a little long on this one, but if you take California separate from the United States, it's like the, uh, third or fourth, fifth largest economy in the world, right? And so, you know, you, you know, leading in that effort where your job at the end of the day, and I just put this very simply, is prosecuting criminals, right? But, uh, you know, if you if you were to just, you know, do some research and, and check her, her record as attorney general, it, for her, it was much more holistic than that. It's, it's you know, okay, we're, we're locking up criminals, but how, what are we doing to ensure that criminals aren't, um, that, that once they're released, that they're able to be productive citizens, right? Um, how are we educating them and how are we providing them job training? And, you know, what are we doing to, to better them as people and citizens, not just locking them up, right? And so um, she understood that in that role, that it was more than just being the top cop. You know, it was, it was about looking out for community and looking out for people, both the criminal and, and the non-criminals. And so you take that and you, you take it to how she, she's going to be as a president. Um, it's it, when, when you have a, a job at that level, as you know, you have to have faith, trust, and confidence in, in, in the people that you choose. And this goes back to one of earlier questions and how you select those people. And then, you know, if you use um, intelligence and, and compassion, um, in, in selecting said people, then you have the ability to trust them to make the right decisions in order to tame what, whatever they, that we, the collective are, def, are defining as success. Um, and so I, I believe that she does have that, that, that ability. Um, she, you know, she's has, she has support in the Senate from her colleagues there. So, you know, the, the ability to work collaboratively with, with Capitol Hill, um, is obviously going to be a good thing. Um, especially, you know, since we're talking about Ukraine, making sure that appropriations are available for the next aid package, right? Um, and having the right people in place to have those conversations, those closed door conversations um, with Hill staff and Hill members. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident that she's going to be able to, uh, that, that she will, yeah, be able to uh, lead in this way. And, you know, and I'll just throw out there, being a black woman gives her a different perspective on things. And so who knows, maybe, she'll have the magic answer that we've all been waiting for for the past 200 years. 
<laughs> it's about time as well. It definitely uh, <laughs> things need to change for sure. And <laughs> in that spirit, that spirit of of uh, having a bolder vision and taking risks in order to attain these goals, she may be coming in. Let's assume she she does become president. Um, I think it's, she's for Ukraine at least. She is um, the best option by by far. Um, she may be faced with really substantial problems, including the mess in the Middle East. But if Russia is comprehensively beaten in Ukraine, which is certainly a possibility, you could see a Russia which is in a degree of, I would say, collapse of one sort or another. The Putin regime may not survive a defeat in Ukraine. There could be some tremendous challenges coming her way. If you were in that team, and you wanted to channel the spirit of George C. Marshall, um, what what would you do to try and shape a world and a Russia um, which is not such a, a threat to security, wealth, innovation, and all those things that we prize? You know, one of the things I've brought up to friends um, over time has been that I think the biggest mistake our leaders made when the Soviet Union collapsed was not bringing Russia into NATO Um, because NATO wasn't formed to be this, wasn't necessarily formed to be an anti-Soviet Union animal. It just became that because the Soviet Union was flexing so hard um, after World War II. Um, You know, but the, you know, the, the fallout from a, a Ukrainian victory over Russia, if there is a, some form of Russia collapse because we know their economy has been on the brink for a good while. Um, civil unrest, who knows, right? But I think the big, the, the first thing I'd figure out is um, what do we do about Wagner, uh, especially especially in Africa? Um, you know, if, if 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 Putin were to be overthrown or go in exile or whatever, um, what role are they going to play? To me, that's the that's the first answer. You know, are they going to start trying to i mean they're already doing this now in africa but are they going to literally just start trying to become their own entity are they going to go you know return to russia or whoever is in in russia are they going to you know try to create some type of uh military state who knows um but to me that's the worst case scenario trying to figure out um i mean we have enough russia expert diplomats who have the relationships in the country um, to help figure something out. But I think taking those lessons learned from 30 years ago and attempting to apply them now um, to make Russia a friend. I mean, the one thing about Russia, it's all since, you know, since the days of um, Catherine the Great, they've always felt like outliers. And there are a lot of historic reasons as to why um, they didn't feel like outliers, why they felt like outliers, why they didn't identify as Europeans. Um, and that's fine if they don't, right? But how do you how do you get the Russian people to feel as though they are a part of the of the family? And however we're defining family, whether that's human family, whether it's that European family, whether that's uh, Atlantic, North Atlantic family, whatever. But how do we bring them into the fold and actually make them legitimate partners um, in in creating? world peace lack of a more lack of a corny way to say that but i think that's the biggest thing because until we can get russia to feel like they're a part of this however that this is defined as positive we're we're never going to be able to get past this whole russia versus the west thing that's the carrot but what about the stick because surely the first priority would be to include Ukraine in the security architecture and these global institutions, because if the attempt to reach out to Russia and shape a new Russia fails, and let's face it, history has shown that that Russia seems to have unfortunately always chosen uh, a more destructive than a constructive path at these pivot points in history, Mm -hmm. we need to be prepared for that to go wrong. And part of that includes a Ukraine, which is fully integrated, is strong, powerful, with its own, and it's heading that way, incredibly powerful military-industrial complex as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously we'd have to, who knows what the outcomes will be and, and what, what the uh, situation will look like. 
after Ukraine wins its war. Uh, definitely good conversation to have, especially with uh, those Eastern European countries that have much more at stake with Ukraine being stable um, and being independent than we here in the United States. And so for me, it, it, it'd be about having those conversations with, we'll just use Poland as an example, right? With with them um, in um, Estonia and whatever, all the other neighboring countries and try to, and figure out what that, what that looks like, you know, whether, it, whether it's Ukraine joining NATO, who knows, you know, obviously that's that, you know, that would be put on the table. Um, you know, what type of additional security Ukraine would need if it's needed. Uh, it may not be needed. You know, they may, you know, the Russian army might be to the point where even if Putin's replacement is just as bad as him, one, they may not have the resource to do it again, or two, the military leadership that will exist at that time will, you know, losing the Ukraine would be so fresh in their mind. They're like, no, let's just respect these borders and get our economy back up and running. So, you know, I, I can't and won't give an actual definitive answer, but to me, it, it's, as I have, I've stressed to uh, folks I've mentored, both my seniors and, and, and supported types, you know, leading isn't always just from the front. It's also, you, know, you can be in the rear to the side and this is one to me where um, though we might be organizing these conversations, um, I think it'd be important, more prudent for those Eastern European countries to be leading in that, right? Uh, so going again to Ukraine being in NATO, um, you know, if the collective is saying, you know what, I think I think Ukraine needs to be in it, then, you know, that that's a different different uh situation than if it's just ukraine saying it um but i would definitely lean on on the eastern european countries to help craft what that solution uh would look like and it's a really interesting point isn't it this this investment in in values because in the couple of years of doing this channel it's become sort of clear to me and in fact since 2016 when really the all these sort of uh, cogs started turning in, in my brain, at least, um, is the autocrats have a playbook. They have a playbook for how to increase the influence, coercion, how to destabilize their enemies, even cause insurrections. And in the case of someone like Georgia, uh, what's called state capture, which is essentially you know, coercive control over an entire uh, country. Right. The majority of the people don't actually want to go in that certain direction that 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 that, that country's institutions are whittled down to an extent. Now, autocrats are constantly innovating this playbook. They're mindful of what's worked and what hasn't, what worked before, what doesn't work now. And they're constantly innovating. It seems to me that we, we do not have the same investment in a democratic playbook a way to not only counter the autocrats uh and their attempts um but to actually project the positive values of democracy since iraq and afghanistan we've got quite shy about this kind of stuff because it right. it's equated with large-scale military intervention but i'm not sure it has to be that, that there's many other ways to do this um do you think uh, Kamala Harris might see this as a key initiative to roll back the forces of autocracies such as China, North Korea, Russia, Syria, uh, and, and once again be a champion for positive uh, values? Yeah, I mean, there's a <laughs> there's a lot of ways um, to answer that one. Right. I mean, first is it's so much easier to be an autocrat than than a Democrat. Right. Um, how are you defining democratic politics in one's country, whether it's yours, whether it's mine, whether it's Canada, Mexico? That's hard work, right? Because you've got to create coalitions. Um, you've got to uh, have some sense of humility. Even if your ego is bigger than the room, you still have to have some sense of humility, right? You, you have to compromise. Uh, you have to go into a situation knowing you're not always going to get what you want. Um, and you have to also go in a situation recognizing that even if you create the world's perfect plan and it starts getting executed, when your term is up, the next guy may say, you know what, we don't like this. Let's let's get rid of it. Right. Um, so, you know, leading in a, in a democratic republic is hard work. Um, because you have to accept the will of the people uh, again, that's relative, but you do. 
Um, and so, you know, to the point of your question, over the past what twenty years, twenty four years, there's been this with this pivot from countries forming democratic republics to forming um, autocracies. And but what what has also has transpired is that um, conflicts have have erupted more around the world. And uh, obviously, we're you know we're focused on Russia Ukraine right now. But there are small things that have been well the people who uh, that that they affect wouldn't define them as small, but you know they don't they don't reach the media, right? The AP is not writing large stories on it, right? Um, you know, all over in the, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Africa. Um, I mean, shoot, um, even back when Georgia and Chet- Chechnya were going on after the first year, you know, the press didn't really care anymore, right? Um, in South South America, so there's stuff going on all over, and I, I believe that the uh, you know before I get into one answer when, when the Arab Spring happened I remember having a conversation with some of my policy wonk friends you know my generation and none of them had ever none of them had been to the Middle East <laughs> and they were like yes they want democracy they want democracy I said no man they just want change they're, they're not like pay attention to what's going on they're not screaming for democracy they're screaming for change they're tired of leader X and they want a fresh start you know, now we need to be there to help them, you know, get to where the, to the, to a positive outcome. But they're not screaming. You can't assume they're screaming to, for democracy. And as we know, they weren't right. They're just screaming for regime change because they were sick and tired. of getting beat down by that guy. But now they're getting beat down by the other guy. Right. And now I see I think they're uh, we're going to start seeing a pivot, um, especially with, um, you know, China abusing its rights slash privileges and in, in, in the continent and, and Wagner too just running ruck, running around ruckus um, literally overthrowing governments or serving as paper governments of countries and, and just acting autoc- autocratically of their own accord because they have more weapons than than some of the than, than, than the folks in these countries or in the cities that they're occupying and I think once we get a uh, uh, once uh, vice president Harris wins the election, um, I think there's going to be a sigh of relief, um, especially once we kind of circulate some of this nastiness that Trump has uh, spewed into our into our public decorum. Um, I think you'll get a sigh of relief from around the world um, and you'll start seeing or will start seeing a pivot back to democratic republic. At the end of the day, it isn't necessarily about which form of government is better. Right. I mean, you could be an autocrat and be the world's greatest leader right but it doesn't guarantee that the next autocrat who follows you is going to be but what democratic republics at least do it it gives excuse me we the people some semblance of control um of their fates and of the actions of those who they elect so that even if two years or the four years or the six years of the person they vote for they define as trash they can at least they at least have the opportunity to get rid of that person. Whereas with the autocrat, you're stuck. And we see where that leads, where it leads yes. is to uh, poor decisions which no one can question. And then they just they carry on as as we see in, in Russia. It doesn't doesn't necessarily turn out well. The other question, of course, is having these principles is fantastic. And supporting democracy in word is fantastic. But Russia has been given extraordinary impunity to cross which we would have thought were red lines. And yet, as it transpires, these weren't red lines or these weren't red lines that we were willing to enforce from the eradication of cities uh, in Syria to the use of chemical weapons in Syria, uh, the capture of Donbass, Crimea, et cetera, the use of chemical weapons, which is now, uh, there's, there's plenty of evidence to show uh, the veracity of that in Ukraine, atrocities, mm-hmm. genocide, torture and rape as a weapon of war on a massive scale, target of energy infrastructure, destruction, theft of grain to threaten the world with famine, gray fleet tankers charging all over the world, you know, threatening ecological catastrophe. And then you've got sabotage and assassination across Europe, which has been happening over the last two years, and to an extent governments have been putting a little bit of a dampener on those stories, 
because if you fully acknowledge what's going on, you have to do something about it. It seems that actually our red lines are very poorly inked and Moscow feels it has complete impunity to ride roughshod on them. Is Kamala Harris going to come in and re-ink some of the red lines and actually enforce them? Which I'm not sure of your view, but my view is the only way to to really uh, limit Putinism and its effect is to push back hard against it. Words mean nothing to him. In fact, words are a sign of weakness. What's your take? I mean, this is maybe, um, again, a mixture of statecraft and and a military response to these things. So I've never been a big fan of red lines, um, not because they force you to take an action, but for the reason why you asked the question, because um, history has shown that too many times a leader will draw a red line and the other leader will cross the red line and the leader who drew the red line is like, oh, well, never mind. Right. And to me, that's the worst form of leadership one can have is not enforcing their own standards. Um, and I just say that in the most simple way, in the simplest way possible. Um, I have led soldiers, as, as you know, you know, and you told the audience. Um, and never would I um, tell a soldier, if you do X, Y is going to happen. And then he does X and I don't do Y. Because then he sh- then he just then knows that um, he he comes to not respect me as a leader, right? And so I look at that situate that scenario and and I, and I correlate it to to your question, and I would say from a strategic perspective, I think what's imperative, um, especially after Ukraine wins, however they define the the win. The U, the UN, actually not the UN, but NATO, um, need leadership needs to sit down, and they need to do a reset on how we're defining, you know, in simple terms, red lines, our policies towards aggressors in, in regards to to aggressors and so forth. Because uh, I I think you know I could be wrong, um, maybe a subject matter expert, but I'm not a nerd in in this stuff. Some of this stuff is probably written. 40, 50 years ago, right? And, and you know, a lot of these policies don't necessarily apply because people change, landscape changes. Um, you know, it, when we had, you know, every U.S. Army um, tank division, or armor division, and cavalry regiment in Germany, maybe some of these policies made sense, right? Fold the gap, go, right? Um, but we're not in a fold the gap era anymore we haven't been really since since the collapse of the berlin wall though we probably still thought we were up until um the towers fell actually i know that because they're making me still memorize warsaw pack vehicles but um, back in 2000 2001 but um i think we ju- i think a nato leadership at a minimum needs to do a reset on policy um and to to um reset how as, as i stated uh, how we deal with aggressors um, and how we support non-NATO countries, right? And supporting the NATO countries uh, obviously is is pretty simple, right? Um, but you know, how do we prevent another Ukraine from happening? Um, and put some structure around that so that leaders, uh, in this case, like President uh, President or well, future President Elect Harris, um, won't unintentionally get caught in a conundrum where a Russia type country has crossed the red line. And maybe it's say it's a red line we didn't know existed. It's like, oh, ma'am, they did X, Y, and Z. Oh, dang it. What what are our, what are our options? Boom, boom, boom. It's like, I don't like those options, <laughs> right? We don't want her to be in that position. And we don't want any leader to find themselves in that position. So, yeah, to restate, I think, yeah, a, a reset on policy is definitely needed. And I've just got two more questions. I mean, one relates directly to, to what you said there, which I think is interesting. Zelensky has gone to uh, Washington recently. He had a list of high value targets. And what and he said this relatively publicly, and I think it's it's quite well known. His conception of surviving and getting a sense of victory against Russia involves taking out the launch sites of 
the ballistic missiles, the Shahid drones and so on, mm-hmm. as well as the aeroplanes that launch things like glide bombs that inflict mass terror and mass casualties in Ukraine. So he's explicit that without taking these out, we cannot protect our civilians. And to an extent, we cannot make the full progress that's required militarily um, to get towards this thing that we define as victory. And of course, they have been declined uh, the ability to strike those things, which speaking to Ben Hodges, speaking to others, looking at some of the recent videos of uh, David Petraeus and others, they all categorically state that these restrictions make no military sense at all. Um, Do you think it's likely that we may get a reassessment of some of these restrictions because you've you've talked about victory being something ukraine needs to find and the war being something they need to choose how to execute but it seems there's quite a high degree of micromanagement taking place uh, on the part of i would have to say especially washington and berlin berlin is, is 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 particularly funny about all sorts of things well yeah i mean militarily it, it makes sense it also makes sense politically, diplomatically for Zelensky to be asking for these things, right? Like, I mean, I thought it was silly that they were asking for tanks and F-16s or F-22s or whatever, knowing that they needed to use drones, and they finally realized they needed drones. But, um, it, yeah, it, it makes sense. But I think to the point of why they're getting the answer of no is because that's going to require us to execute. Um, and we already we already know Zelensky and his leadership are willing to do whatever they need to do that they are tangibly doing. This is action that will require us, and we don't want to get drawn into this war. And Germany doesn't either, right? And I know the UK doesn't, right? And so that's why they're being told no. And sure, yeah, Petraeus is saying, yeah, militarily doesn't make sense uh, in regards to our support, but it actually, yeah, but. It, it doesn't, right? Like he needs to further answer his answer the question. It's like, okay, do you want to go over there and push the button? It's like, no, you don't. So um, I don't both sides are right, right? It's one of those conversations you go in, you're right, you're right, but I disagree with you, but I disagree with you. You know you're both right. Um, and who knows what tomorrow will will, will lead and you know, who knows what'll happen once uh, we get into a new administration, but I wouldn't support it either. Um, simply because I don't want us to get drawn in um, to another war. Uh, we don't know how how desperate uh, Putin would act if he actually learned, um, which would be very obvious, that the United States officially has entered the war, because that's what it would be. Right? That's what the headline would say, whether that's true or not. Right? The, the New York Times, whatever Moscow's newspaper is, U.S. attacks, Russian this and that. And then it's over, right? Um, so why maybe letting the British do it? The sneaky little British with their storm shadows, you know. Oh yeah, nothing, nothing to do with us. It's those damn Brits, you know. Right. <laughs> I support that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last question here is, of course, we're we're reliant on the point of view that Ukrainian victory is important. The detail is something we are still awaiting. But with your military hat on. What would be your priorities here uh, to ensure, you know, the survival of the Ukrainian state, to minimize civilian casualties and to edge towards something that could be defined as victory? What do you think militarily could be brought to bear that doesn't necessarily fall into that bucket of being, you know, significantly escalatory? Well, let me see how to answer this question. The, The biggest lesson President Washington learned during the revolution, or as we define as the revolution, um, is that you got to pay salaries, right? If, if soldiers aren't getting paid, <laughs> doesn't matter how much they believe in the fight or the cause, they're not going to fight. And so we, at least at a minimum, we got to make sure that um, Zelensky has, uh, in, in his co- in his government, have the, 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 the resources and the, to, to, to pay his people to, you know, whether it's the, the military personnel, the, the government entities that, that administer um, them, lack of a more nuanced way of putting that. Um, the other one, too, this kind of goes back to the last question, and that is, is working with them 
um, and I, I know this is happening and it doesn't get reported, but, you know, working with them to um, create unique, innovative ways of winning that, um, that, uh, how I want to put this, where they're the ones doing the tangible action, right? Um, and then supporting them in those efforts. Um, I think that th those two things um, would be the most beneficial. And I think we're doing them now, but, you know, to, to your earlier point, obviously there'll be some slight change and change of administrations. But, um, you know, the biggest thing is just reassuring the, both reassuring the U Ukrainian people that we are not going to abandon them. And because then that also gives the message to Putin that we're not going anywhere. Um, and, you know, once, you know, Russia really, really gets to the brink, you know, may maybe it'll force him to say, you know what, this is it. But God bless pride sometimes. Pride will kill. So. <laughs> well, it's been a massive pleasure talking again. I think there's lots of really fascinating details to, to chew over there. Um, and of course, we await more detail um, from what, is hoped to be the new administration in the US. But for now, thanks so much for coming and contributing uh, once again so generously to the channel. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it.